Klaus, Hinky, DePola, Embiid, balling in his new Ferrari. Hashtag the process. Hashtag he died for our sins. Hashtag vampire diaries. You are locked on fantasy basketball. Your daily fantasy basketball podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Fantasy Basketball Podcast brought to you by Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at BasketballMonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at RedRock underscore B-Ball. Today's show also brought to you by Hotels.com, by Untuck It and by Grip6 Belts. We're going to be looking at the Philadelphia 76ers. Their season in review, Michael Bolton. Let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it, indeed. Let's start by looking at how this team fared. Fifty-one and thirty-one, the third uh, third best team in the Eastern Conference, had a pretty comfortable win again in the first round of the playoffs against the Nets after losing Game One, four-one there, and then lost in Game Seven, heartbreaking fashion to the Toronto Raptors on that Kawhi uh, buzzer beater shot that hit the rim five times and bounced in, and they they got knocked out. In that second round of the playoffs, had uh, some disappointing moments. They made some big swings, of course, during the season. And their offseason is going to be unbelievably interesting with all these decisions that have to be made, not by only by themselves, but by players who are on this team. Eighth best pace in the NBA, 15th in defense, eighth in offense. One of the elite teams in the NBA who did have you know, maddening stretches of inconsistency, which was always bothersome, but then can turn it on and match it with the absolute best in the league. They had the second most free throw attempts in the NBA, fourth most assists, fourth most rebounds. It helps when your point guard is Ben Simmons and he can grab those big amounts of rebounds. And then you've got guys like Embiid grabbing uh, rebounds. Assists are coming from Simmons. They're coming from Butler. Tobias Harris getting into the mix late in the season. Um, you know, doing lots of lots of really good stuff offensively, defensively. Embiid probably a step down from where he was the year before, but still really strong. Fourth in the NBA in block shots. They uh, get to the line a, a whole ton. A really, a, a really strong, strong team that was you know, in the end met a really good Toronto team that knocked them out in that second round of the playoffs and that top end of the Eastern Conference is obviously really strong. We saw that with those top three teams being really, really, uh, really, really good. Uh, even that's a, a poor choice of word for me. Um, yeah, the, the Sixers came uh, came unstuck. Brett Brown will remain the, as the coach for this team, which he absolutely should. Um, yeah, hard to you know, kick a guy out because they lost to a, a weird buzzer beater from Kawhi Leonard after another strong season. But again, this offseason, as I mentioned, is going to be really interesting. And that is because of the big free agent decisions that need to be made. Three of their starting five players are going to be free agents. Tobias Harris, who they traded for at the trade deadline, JJ Redick, and Jimmy Butler, who has a player option for almost $20 million, but there is absolutely no chance that he is going to be taking that. So Butler, Harris, and Redick are all going to be unrestricted free agents. So you can look and say, well, they can get to $40 million in in cap space. That's not what they're about because that means they have to renounce all those players. They're about bringing their guys back, throwing Max off as at Butler and Harris, bringing Redick back again. They are. They want to bring this core of players back into this uh, into this team and get a full off season, a full season. And we remember Jimmy Butler didn't arrive before the season had started. Then Tobias Harris came, so another full season. They want to bring that back. Maybe the hardest guy to bring back here might be Redick. It's going to push them into pretty significant tax uh, tax type areas, luxury tax areas, by bringing Butler, Harris, and then Redick back all on really really big contracts. The other free agent decisions they have. There's Boban Marjanovic, who came across into Tobias Harris' deal. He's got a $13 million cap hold. Look, by the time they sign guys like Harris and Butler and Redick, if that's what they do, yeah, renouncing guys' cap holds is not going to mean anything because they're not going to have that ability to go and sign other guys with cap space. So Boban yeah, might actually keep his cap hold there if they want to bring him back at a cheaper price, of course, but that might be difficult to do. Mike Scott, an unrestricted free agent who had his moments but came up big at times in the playoffs. Uh, Furkan Korkmaz, who they declined his rookie option, then he played pretty well, then he got injured. Uh, They still have an unrestricted cap hold on him, but he is unrestricted, and they can't go any higher than the $2 million he would have been paid this season. TJ McConnell, Amir Johnson, and Greg Munro. As Greg runs in, we realize this could get dangerous. They're all unrestricted free agents as well. John Simmons, who came across in the Markel Fultz trade, who was trash. He's a non-guaranteed deal, while James Ennis has declined his player option after he came across 
from the Houston Rockets signing uh, that really small uh, three, two-year, $3 million deal with them. And he played a really key role for this team in getting a guy like that back. It, it would be really good for them, but I'm not sure they're going to be able to afford James Ennis, unfortunately. So lots of decisions there. Butler, Harris, Reddick, Boban. Uh, Prison Mike, Furkan Korkmaz, Jimmy Ennis, TJ McConnell, Amir Johnson, Greg Munro, all these guys out of contract. The, un- the only guys that we've got actually under contract, Embiid, Simmons, DRC, Zaire Smith, and Jonah Bolton, plus the non-guarantee of John Simmons. So bringing these other guys back is really, really key. Now, if Butler, Harris, Reddick, Boban, if all those guys leave, they can get up to $60 million in cap space by everyone leaving and uh, and Butler declining his player option and leaving as well. But getting in the mix to get those sort of players means that you have to say, well, we're out on all these guys, renounce all their cap holds and their bird rights and all that stuff so you can go sign other players. And I just don't think that's something that the Philadelphia Sixers, 70, Philadelphia Sixers, that sounds just so terrible. You can call them the Sixers, sounds fine. You can call them the Philadelphia 76ers, great. You cannot call them the Philadelphia Sixers. And I just, uh, I just fell for the oldest trick in the book, calling them a name that makes no sense. But anyway, that's how that team looks. That's how their off-season looks coming up. Lots of interesting decisions that need to be uh, made by this squad. And if you're looking for an interesting decision to, to make, you should be looking at subscribing to this podcast, but doing so on the Himalaya podcast app. It's free, it's easy to use, and every single podcast that you're looking for is there. They have curated playlists, personally curated for you by their expert podcast taste makers. So go ahead and uh, subscribe to their themed collection of shows. That's the Himalaya podcast app. Download it, and while you're there, subscribe to Locked On Fantasy Basketball as well. Let's look at these players now. Let's start with the process. Joel Embiid, who um, people were a little bit cautious about drafting him in that first round. He had an ADP of 16. I was looking at him around that 11 and 12 mark. A lot of people like I wouldn't even touch him in the second round. He finished the season as the seventh ranked player. So me having him at 11, 12, I, I, um, I'm pretty happy with that. I, I see this as an absolute win. He played... 64 games, almost 34 minutes a game, 27 and a half points, 1.2 triples, almost 14 rebounds, uh, almost four assists. He had 0.7 steals. He had almost two blocks, just a whole bunch of really impressive numbers from Embiid. 48 and 80 from the field and from the line. He only shot 30% from three. So that really stands out where you go, well, if he can get that to 34 or 35, then that takes that field goal percentage up. It takes the scoring up and it takes the three pointers up as well. So three point percentage is, is not a category that's used in many leagues. But even if it doesn't, it has a huge impact because it it directly influences three categories, field goal percentage, three-pointers, and points. So if he gets that to 34%, then does he become the fifth best player, the fourth best player? I'd be hesitant to take him there just because there will be times where his knee plays up and his back plays up. And maybe best case scenario for Embiid is 70 games in a season. Maybe. But we're getting 60, 64 here. We would have got close to 70 last year as well. These are these are really good numbers, especially in a rotisserie format. He's a, a very, very good rotisserie guy. Head-to-head, there's always that risk. What if he sits out games in the playoffs? And, and that becomes a real pain in the ass. There's no doubt about that. But he was able to put together some really strong games. Missed a whole bunch of games at the end of February. But even after that, or before that, it was only just spot games that he missed. He missed one in December. Sorry, two in December. uh, One game in January. Played all of October and November. Missed uh, two games in uh, in January, and then missed that stretch of uh, of eight games uh, at the end of February, start of March. He missed one game, uh, another another two games in March, and five games in April. So it's not an ideal time for those games for him to be sitting out. Um, but it weren't, well, they weren't significant injuries. They were more just a, a management type thing. The minutes that he played were obviously impressive as well. He went from 30 minutes a game last season up to almost 34 minutes a game this year. Obviously, he's uh, the key to this team. Uh, comfortably led the team in wins added and PIPM, no surprise there. Plus 9.6 on off. As part of that's because they just had nothing happening at backup center and really couldn't get anything going there. But Embiid was obviously impressive. He'll be a first round guy again next season. Whether you have the appetite to take on that risk of injuries, it still does remain. But I think we can, you know, we're not looking at him as this guy that's never playing. It's just that there are going to be missed games. You should never rely on anybody playing 82 games. So that, that's Everyone knows that. You shouldn't be relying upon that. But 70, 65 versus 75 is a difference. And in head-to-head leagues, it's more important where you miss those games. And that that is a bit of a concern for me with Embiid as we move forward. Let's look at the next guy. Because he's my butler. 
Jimmy Butler, the 23rd ranked player overall. It was a bit of a roller coaster for Butler. I thought he'd be a strong mid second round guy. Tanned out, he's going to be an end of the second round guy. I thought that I didn't really see Philadelphia as a suitor for Butler in a trade. So I thought, yeah, when he gets traded for Minnesota, he's going to go to a team. He's going to run that team. He's going to be the number one guy there. Unfortunately for Jimmy Butler's fantasy value, he went to Philadelphia where he wasn't the number one guy. He was the number two guy, at times the number three guy and had some trouble fitting in there. And that pushed him down to the 23rd rank overall. So yeah, I was okay taking him in that mid-second round. In the end, it, it wasn't a complete whiff. It wasn't a complete uh, you know, disaster. But he didn't live up to that expectation of being the 14th ranked player, which he was each of the last two seasons. Still averaged almost 19 points with five boards and four assists, almost two steals, 46 and 86, and shot 33% from three. But that's down from being a 20-point per game scorer for each of the previous four seasons. The efficiency, this is what we get from Butler. His last five field goal percentage seasons, 46, 45, 46, 47, 46. Like that is as consistent as you get. The free throws, excellent. 83, 83, 87, 85, 86. On big attempts, although that did drop this year, we saw his usage go from 25 down to 21. You would think he'll be back in Philadelphia, so well, that's my expectation. I think that maybe we see a little bit more from Butler. I could see his assists going up next season, but in terms of usage, uh, in terms of scoring, I think what we got from him this season is a, a pretty decent facsimile of what we see from him the next two to three years in Philadelphia, uh, assuming he remains there. Now, he is about to turn 30. He will be 30 at the beginning of next season. So in three years' time, maybe that talent has started to drop off a little bit for Butler, a guy who's battled quite a few injuries in his career, has uh, some minutes on the board, no doubt about that. So maybe maybe it's only two seasons that you get this level of production out of Butler rather than three or four, which will be the length you know, of his contract. We'll be signing five-year deals with, uh, with the Sixers. There are other other considerations with his value and his current age. But you know, on this Sixers team, I wouldn't be expecting him to jump back up to being that 14th ranked player again. A plus 2.3 PIPM, second on this team, pretty comfortably second on this team as well. And on off our plus 3.9, no surprise there. The Sixers bench and their lack of bench strength was a was a key factor all through the season, especially during the playoffs when they when they really just were calling out for anybody to be able to perform. Now Benny Simmons obviously disappointed his ADP. His ADP was pretty nonsense, I think, at 15. Now hope, I'm saying this, I, I'm pretty sure I didn't have him ranked at number 15. That seemed a bit too high. Uh, 79 games, 34 minutes, 17, 9, and 8 with one and a half steals and 0.8 blocks, 56 and 60 percent from the line. And that's the real issue there, of course. Of course, he didn't hit any threes. That 60% from the line on five and a half attempts makes him a punt free throw guy. I do think he can have seasons where he gets to 70%. It's not looking great at this point, but I think he can get to that level. But what we saw from Sim, and now people love throwing this on Sims. Oh, he's, he's already at his ceiling. He's never going to improve from here. I, I think there's a bit of bullshit involved in that. I don't think that we should be looking at him going, well, he's never going to get better. I think at some point he will be able to at least attempt a three. I'd like to have seen him done do it already, which it is quite disappointing that he's not even yeah, ready to take those. But he's still able to do all this while not attempting a single three. Like, do all this stuff. Now, he did actually take, I think, a couple of threes this season. In total, he had six three-point attempts this year, and they weren't all end-of-quarter heaves. But he needs to be able to do it. I feel confident that he can hit them at an okay-ish rate, not a great one, but Russell Westbrook's out here chucking seven a game, hitting 29%. I think Simmons could, could hit it at that rate. He just doesn't doesn't do it, and he, that needs to be drilled in because it does open up so much more. But getting a point guard who can give you those block numbers, that field goal percentage, along with those rebounds and assists, makes him a valuable fantasy guy. And you punt free throws. Maybe he does actually move up to that area where where he could have been yeah, at that draft spot, that ADP of 15. Is, is he a guy that if you punt free throws, he becomes the 15th best player? Well, that's a question we have to look at, and I'm looking at it now. Actually, he does become the 17th ranked player in a punt free throw build. So maybe that's not too far off. That just shows how much of an impact that uh, that area has. But he does need to, to improve in that three-point shooting, just being able to take even some long twos, which is something that he's uh, you know never really shown, but is still able to be. And this is the problem with Simmons, is all throughout his career, his NBA career, college career, he's been successful without doing any of those things. It's like people who are left-hand dominant, and they just go through all of their life only shooting with their left hand because they're successful at it. So why change what they Why shouldn't change what works really? Because they are. They can get to that shot whenever they want. Uh, Simmons is in the uh, sixth percentile in terms of taking long twos. That uh, according to Clean the Glass, like that he just doesn't take these shots. 
And, but he finishes at the rim at a ridiculous rate, 67%, which is 98th percentile for a combo guard, which is how cleaning the glass lists him. So he's really successful at doing that. Where where does he go from here? Well, the addition of Tobias Harris and Jimmy Butler hurt him a little bit. His usage dropped by almost two percentage points, but he, he brings it up in those other areas. But the other area that Butler does hurt him is the drop in assists because Butler handles the ball more. So again, if these guys all come back, what could we expect to improve from Simmons next season? He did take his free throws up by four percentage points. Maybe that could happen again. But yeah, you know, I, I look at it and go, well, maybe this is the guy. You've got to be punting free throws and you've got to be willing to take him. You know, probably early second round it is a decent enough spot to, to do that. Rotisserie becomes hard because you've got two massive negatives with threes and free throws. Although threes can be a little bit easier to recover from. Um, and it, it makes him a little bit harder of a roto guy, but in points leagues, he's uh, he's much more successful. Um, and uh, in those free throw head-to-head uh, punt free throw builds, he is really, really useful. But you know, taking that next step forward and where he goes from here, it is a little bit hard with the current structure of this team to see exactly what area Simmons is going to do that for us. Don't forget today's show brought to you by Untuck It by Grip6 Belts. Go to grip6.com slash lock and hotels.com. Make sure you don't hate like your friend's trip. Book your own with hotels.com. Get rewarded basically everywhere. Hotels.com, be there, do that, and get rewarded. All righty then. Let's look at the next guy. It is Toby Harris, who played the majority of the season for the Clippers, then went to the uh, then went to the Sixers in that trade deadline deal. We did see a little bit of a drop off in his production. The usage dropped over that course of the time with the Sixers. Not surprisingly, he's got to share the ball with Butler, with Embiid, and with Simmons. So we saw some of those numbers drop. The minutes still remained, and he was the 43rd ranked player. But curiously, over the final 30 games of the season, the 87th ranked player, the scoring went down from 20 points per game down to 16 points per game game. Um, but the part of that, and it's not just all to do with a drop in uh, in usage, and that that is part of it. There's there's no doubt that sharing the ball with uh, with Embiid, with uh, with Butler, with Simmons ha- has an impact. It, it's not just all of that. It's more the fact that when he got there, he didn't shoot well. Now he shot. He scored 21 points per game with the Clippers, 18 over the course of the time with the Sixers, but 43% three point shooting in LA, 33 with the Sixers. That is a really, really big difference. And the two-point percentage actually went up in Philadelphia. But the fact that he dropped by 10 percentage points in his three-pointers, that's not an explicable number. That's not something we can go, well, of course, because of these other guys handling the ball, he couldn't shoot. It's just a weird 27-game sample where he couldn't hit th- couldn't hit threes. Will that bounce back? To He's, a, he's still shot 40% overall for the season. So will he come back and come in and be a high 30s three-point guy? Because that solves a lot of the problems. And that stops him from being the 87th ranked guy over his time in Philadelphia and pushes him back into that top 50 discussion. So while we look at it and go, eh, it wasn't a great fit, it cost him some usage, he two fewer points per game, That so much of that is 10 percentage points less on his three-pointers. And that two points fewer per game, well, he hit two threes a game as a member of the Clippers and 1.6 threes a game as a member of the Sixers. Now that's 0.4 threes a game, which is obviously not the be all and end all, but it's about a point a game just because he didn't hit his threes at the same rate. And then instead of, if he goes from 21 21 points the average in LA up to 19 points, it it becomes a little bit more palatable. And those changes can, they can be five ranking spots, 10 ranking spots, that change in field goal percentage from 50 down to 47, you get that back up to 50. And then we're talking about a player that does push back into that top half again. So I don't think we need to be overly worried about uh, about Harris, although you know, there are some hits happening there. He, he, interestingly enough, had a negative PIPM during his time in Philadelphia, only 944 minutes, but still a negative there. But we don't know where he's going to end up. Lots of teams are going to be interested in Tobias. I think the Sixers will be prioritizing him underneath Butler, but yeah, they would like to bring him back as well. And I think we see we don't see the him as an, a, a top ninety player next season. I think he's more of a, but he's not a top thirty guy. He's more of a top sixty, top fifty five sort sort of a player. Uh, assuming everyone comes back, and the Sixers are actually one point five points better off with him on the bench this season as well, which is a little bit. Uh, it's not worrying, but it's a little bit uh, curious. JJ Redick just missed out on being a top one hundred player, one hundred and second overall, thirty one minutes a game for JJ. 18 points with two and a half, or sorry, 3.2 triples, 2.5 rebounds, 2.7 assists, no defensive numbers, 44 and 89, including 40% from three. His value pretty clearly coming from three-pointers and coming from hitting almost 90% of his free throws. 
A drop down from last season, not a surprise. He played more minutes. But what we saw is that the overall shooting from him dropped a little bit. He was a, he's was he been a 40-plus guy each of the last four seasons. 44, 48, 43, and 42. This season, down, down not much, but down to 39.7. And that's enough to drop him down from you know that 80 spot down to the 100 spot. Redick is old. We, we know this. He's going to be 35 very, very soon. We don't know what team he's going to be on. I think he's going to really move into that not a must-draft player territory. At 102, you, you are a must-draft guy, but he is providing really just value in those two categories. But if he moves into a spot where he's playing 28 minutes a night, then he becomes more of a 14-team league guy, a streaming 12-team league guy with pretty limited upside. I think that's the key part there because we can say, well, he's going to finish the season as a 120th ranked guy. That means he's draftable. But when you're picking in the 120s, I don't want a guy who's going to finish in the 120s. I want to take a flyer on a guy who might finish in the 70s because that's what wins you a league, not drafting a guy in the 120s who remains in the 120s all season and is in his solid because that's exactly what Redick is. He's solid. Plus 2.3, uh, sorry, plus 3.3 on off, plus 0.83 PIPM. Defensively, he showed out okay, but still had more moments. Uh, as he gets older, it becomes harder uh, to defend when you've always got those limited defensive skills, which is exactly where we sit with JJ Redick. After that, it's a big drop off. TJ McConnell, the next highest ranked player, 203rd overall. He is an unrestricted free agent. We don't know what his future holds. I don't think they should be prioritizing bringing him back. He provides grit and toughness and any other white guy adjective you can throw at him, but he can't shoot. It's a bad fit next to Simmons. He has moments, like when he plays the Knicks and he hits game winners and gets triple doubles, but overall, it was a big step backwards, I thought, this year for TJ. 6-2 and 3.5 and with a steal. The 52% shooting is impressive, obviously. 78% from the line is pretty strong. But it was a step back in terms of playing time, uh, in, in terms of production. Um, the shooting did, did improve, but the three-pointers went... His three-point percentages are wild. The last three seasons, 20, 44, and then 33%. So I have no idea what to make of TJ McConnell as a three-point shooter. He is really all over the place in, in, uh, in those numbers. Really, the advanced stats hated him. Negative 1.85 PIPM and negative offensively and defensively and negative 4.1 on-off. I think the Sixers really need to be looking to bring somebody in instead of him. Having the ability to do that is tough, given their cap situation and their off-season dreams and goals. But I just don't think McConnell is that guy. Now, he'd fit really well on a few other teams. Um, I'd, I'd really love to see him go over and take on the Sean Livingston role, say, with the, the Warriors. Maybe that works. But then, they, for as good as a team as they are in terms of shooting, they still need shooting. So I, I really think that it's not a great fit for him here in Philadelphia, and I could see him moving on. He is, even if some guys decided, hey, we want him to be our starter, they'd be wrong. But if they decided that, um, I still don't think he's this excellent fantasy guy, you know, not hitting threes, not a strong rebounder. Um, and I think he'd get found out a little bit more with his efficiency, which was, again, really strong, but I'm not sure it sticks at that level. Everyone's favorite, Bobar Marjanovic, the 246th ranked player overall. 12 minutes a game, seven and a half and five. And the story is the same. Boban is a per minute monster. That's great. He just can't play those minutes. Only 12, 12 minutes a game this season. Could not, you know, had that opportunity in LA with Montrez Harrell and Marching Gortat. Didn't see the floor every night. Came to Philadelphia, who was screaming out for a backup center. He played and he struggled. And then we had him, you know, in and out of uh, lineups there. Got injured at times. He is going to turn 31 in a few months time as well. The field goal percentage is excellent. Great free throws. Good block rate. Scores and rebounds at crazy, crazy rates. He just cannot stay on the court enough to actually make this, not, and not from injury, just from level of play, to make it interesting enough for him to be a regular guy. Negative 0.07 PIPM, which is a fine number, negative 1.6 on off. I think Boban will probably end up leaving Philadelphia. I'd like to see them just develop Jonah Bolden more in that role to become that backup center ahead of him and, and Amir. And Boban's always going to have that appeal. Oh, it's Boban time. And he's going to have these games. He's going to come out and he's going to put up, you know, 15 and 7 in, in 18 minutes with two blocks. And people are going to get as rock hard as possible when thinking about it. And then he's going to be played off the court in seven minutes in the next game. And that is the problem with Boban. We all love him. He's a, he's a massively, like, great guy, fun guy, super per minute guy. But per minute means nothing unless you can actually translate and get those minutes. And unfortunately, uh, Boban can't. He can't get that playing time that uh, that would be necessary. 
I do want to talk about Jimmy Ennis, who uh, struggled in Houston, you know, had his moments here in Philadelphia, didn't really get a huge opportunity to, to be a fantasy-relevant player, but he, he was he's a key player that they'd love to be able to bring back. I'm just not sure they're going to. He played better in the playoffs in the regular season. Negative 1.92 PIPM is not a good number from Ennis. He hit about a three a game. Almost seven points with three boards and 0.7 steals, 47 and 72. But he's a name to watch. If he finds himself on a team, maybe he goes back to the Pelicans and plays 29 minutes a game. He would be a 14-team league str- uh, um, fringe guy. But he's already 29. I think we just have to realize that Ennis is who he is at this point. Um, he's never going to take big steps forward. He's never going to become a volume scorer. But I think his usage could stand to increase from the 12% that it was this year. And two teams, it's really hard to get touches, the Rockets and the Philadelphia 76ers. Jonah Bolden, the 267th ranked player. I really like what I saw from Bolden as a rookie. Five and four with 0.9 blocks, half a steal. He 0.83s, 49. The 48% from the line is obviously horrible. 35% from three is, is pretty encouraging. But this is a guy that if he played... Found himself a role. He's Rashawn Holmesy. Like, and we talk about guys who are permanent guys. He's not quite as permanent as Holmes or as Boban, but he's a guy that I go. Well, he can hit threes. He can score. He can block shots. He can get steals. He can uh, he can get a high field goal percentage. The free throws are a worry, but there are multiple things that Jonah Bolden can do. I think he is the guy they should be developing as their backup center. I think that those 14 minutes a game in 44 games should go to 19 minutes a game in 75 games next season, and we really start to see him become a top 200 player. Can he ever be a top 100 guy? It's probably doubtful. It would require a trade most likely or a long-term Embiid injury. But he's got that really interesting game where he can do multiple things. I thought he held up defensively really well as a center, can play some power forward. Negative 0.89 PIPM is, is really good as a rookie. Negative 2.8 on off is not fantastic, but it's also not a complete disaster. I really liked what Bolden was able to do, and I was encouraged. And his first summer league, I was all in. His second one, he looked lost. And then this one, uh, this season, he, he came out pretty strong. And, and I think he's got a, a decent enough future in the NBA. Zaire Smith, we just didn't see anything from uh, from DRC really at all this season. He had that uh, foot injury to begin the season and that weird, whatever it was, sesame oil allergy that cost, caused him to miss nearly the entirety of the season um, with, that, with that allergic reaction, ca- caused him to lose a ton of weight. We only saw six NBA games from Zaire. 18 and a half minutes, seven points, two rebounds, a three. 1.7 assists, 0.3 steals, 0.3 blocks, 38% from three, 41 and 75. They're strong enough numbers. They're encouraging numbers. This is a guy who I have, it's a real hit or miss, but I think his, his ceiling is absolutely sky high. His ability to get steals and blocks, hit some threes, score, take that to a new level. I think there's some development in playmaking that can come from him. It's hard to you know, say someone is Kawhi Leonard because no one is Kawhi Leonard because we know how good Kawhi Leonard is, but... I think that Zaire has got that ability to really blossom in that, those offensive areas that we didn't get to see this year. And here's a guy that I'm still really, really high on in Dynasty Leagues. Now, th- there's a lot happening here with Philadelphia. If Butler and Harris are gone, then Zaire's going to have to play a large role. If Reddick's gone, then he's going to have to step up. If Ennis isn't back, he's going to have to step up. How much he has to step up is really dependent on what happens in July. Or is he traded to another team at some point as part of a deal? to further consolidate Philadelphia's assets, and he finds himself in a large role. I am very, very far from out on Zaire. We saw nothing from him this year. There was some encouraging signs. There is excitement in this guy. There is good defensive prospects. There is an 85% chance he amounts to nothing. But I think that that top end, really, I think that if everything goes right, he can be a top 40 fantasy player, I think. Uh, that's where I see him getting to. Sorry, let's try that again. That's where he could get to if everything pans out in that 15% chance. The chances of him getting there obviously aren't aren't that high. We're we're still a a long way away from that, and he's he's got a lot of development, a lot of development to to get to that level. I'm just I I still have that still have that hope that we're we're not. um, we're not completely out on uh, on Zaire at this point, and neither should you. You should be encouraged uh, and, and ready to see what happens. Now, Furkan Korkmaz, a guy that... I, only 22, Furkan. 
Rookie option decline, unrestricted free agent. A guy that I think is going to be in demand. A wing with decent length, who can hit threes, who can play make a little bit. Defensively, there are some issues with Furkan. It's not a complete disaster, though. His advanced stuff was actually pretty okay this season. And a massive plus 6.3 on off is huge from Korkmaz in, in really his first go at, uh, at, at consistent action. And knee injury did you know, limit him to 48 games. Six points, a three a game. Only 33% from three, 82 from the line, generates some steals. I think his overall upside is capped because he's not going to be a high defensive stack guy. He never gets assists and he's a low rebounder. But in terms of contributing to an NBA team, maybe he can be a similar player to Ennis, a guy that can score with a little bit more creation and ball handling ability uh, and, and with some length as well. Korkmaz, I think, is going to be in, in some demand. Prison Mike, Mike Scott, 31 years of age, 18 minutes, 6 points. I don't really think this guy is that good of a player and he's not their answer. The advanced stats absolutely hated him. By far the worst player in this team by wins added and PIPM. Uh, a negative 4.8 on off, the worst on this squad as well. At his age, he can bomb threes and he, he hit them at 40%. That's useful. Just really struggles in so many other areas. And he becomes just a deep league streamer for threes. John Simmons, I mentioned earlier, about to turn 30 in a couple of months' time, which you wouldn't, probably wouldn't realize. He was a disaster. Can't shoot, can't dribble. He can generate assists. I just don't think he's a good player. Uh, we saw that the Sixers needed wings and he just didn't play because he, he's not that good. If you have any idea, even if he goes, if they cut him, if he goes somewhere else and a team signs him and looks like he's going to start, just don't get excited about him because he just isn't good. Let's talk Shake Milton, one of their other rookies, 22 years of age, 13 minutes a game, four points, 1.7 rebounds, half a steal, 0.9 blocks. It was okay from Shake, probably better than we could have expected, but still, he's a long way to go. Now, could he really be the guy that steps up and takes over from TJ McConnell last season? I think the Sixers would love that because he can shoot a little bit. Didn't shoot well this year, but he can shoot a little bit. But he's got a long way to go. But he's someone that I think that, you know, 388th ranked player this season, could he step up and move into the 200s? Probably not. 250s, maybe. Uh, I think there is a possibility there for Shake, and he should be a guy that they at least want to use as that third stringer, maybe push into a second string role. But there were some moments from him, but the shooting just needs to get better. The other three, the other guys, Amir Johnson, uh, Greggy Munro, Haywood Highsmith, very little to talk about with those guys. Although Munro still showed that he can put up numbers when he's out there, just getting him out there, much like Boban, can be tough given some of his limitations that can get him played off the court pretty bloody quickly. That'll wrap it up for the Philadelphia 76ers season in review. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on that Himalaya podcast app and give us a rating on iTunes. Five star, Apple Podcasts, actually. Five stars would be great. Find us on Google Podcasts, Spotify as well, and on YouTube. Subscribe, give me a thumbs up, and check out our sponsors, Hotels.com, Untuck It, and Grip6 Belts. Follow me on Twitter at RedRock underscore Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya. <laughs>